th thank you for that. So uh, good morning, everybody, or, or good evening over here in China. Today, I'm going to be talking about the office of sheriff in the Tudor period from 1485 to 1603. So here on the on the first slide, you can see a very striking you can see a very striking picture of uh, of a sheriff from the this is a this is a 19th century imagining of what a what a sheriff would have looked like in the 15th century. Um, I think there's a certain degree of artistic license because he looks a little bit like William Shakespeare, but uh, the key the key feature is the white staff. So uh, the white staff was the was the symbol of the the sheriff's office. Obviously, gave the sheriff a an aspect of majesty and aura of uh, being the king's officer. Also, it was used for technical reasons. So if he if he needed to summon someone in a legal action for land, he would uh, erect the white staff or a white staff on the on the land in question as a way of as a way of summoning a tenant to court. Um, so yeah, would you mind uh, changing the next slide, please? Thank you. So as many of you probably already know, the the sheriff. Uh, was introduced into England by the Anglo-Saxons. So uh, the, show, the original word was skirgarifa. Apologies if there are any Anglo-Saxonists in here and I'm pronouncing that not quite right, uh, but that, that literally meant Shire Reeve. And the, the first clear documentary evidence of his existence in England is from the reign of Edgar uh, in, the in the 10th century. And after, after the Norman conquest, sheriffs became the most important royal officers in each county. By the end of the 14th century, however, the sheriff had lost most of his independent executive authority. So that's 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 really crucial. So often the sheriffs are called kings of their counties. So uh, by the by the Tudor period, the sheriffs are no longer kings of their counties. They they are descendants of the 14th century sheriff. So the 14th century was when really important legislation was introduced to to limit to limit the uh, well limit the responsibilities of sheriffs and also limit their capacity for for independent action. Um, that, that's often encapsulated in the phrase, the decline of the sheriff. Uh, something I argue about in the book is that uh, there wasn't really a decline of the sheriff. It, it, there was a decline in the sheriff's independence, but not a decline in the sheriff's importance. The sheriff remained important throughout the, the period. Uh, th thank you, could you change the next slide? So I'm talking about the Tudor period, but I'm aware there are many medievalists in here. So I wanted to recommend a couple of books. So. In 1927, William Alfred Morris published uh, an excellent book called The Medieval English Sheriff to 1300. And that, that was published by Manchester University Press. Um, and it really is a fine book. It's, 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 the prose style is, is wonderful. And, um, and it's in, in, it, in, it, in, in its sweeping range, it really hasn't been, really hasn't been uh, superseded since then. Of course, um, 1927 is quite a long time ago. So scholars have... Have discovered new things and and uh, and adapted some of Morris's conclusions, but as a as a general overview to the to the Shrievalty in, in that period, it's uh, it's excellent. Another another interesting book is uh, Richard Gorsky's monograph published in two thousand and three, the fourteenth century sheriff, English local administration in the late Middle Ages. So, I'm sure many of you have already read that. Actually, um, in my opinion, it's not quite as wide wide ranging or um, well, and I'll just say that, that it's not as wide ranging as uh, as W. A. Morris's book, but it's um, it, it turns his attention to some things which weren't considered by Morris. For example, the social status of sheriffs, the, the age the age at which men were appointed, and so on. So uh, so both both together are uh, are useful. And could you change the next slide, please? So some fundamentals about the the office of sheriff in our period. Every high sheriff ruled over a sheriffwick or bailiwick, and this was normally one or two counties. Some important towns were known as counties corporate and had their own municipal sheriffs, either one or two. And it's important to bear in mind that the jurisdictions of high and municipal sheriffs were strictly separate. So a sheriff of York couldn't arrest someone in Beverly, in Yorkshire, and a sheriff of Yorkshire couldn't arrest someone in the city of York, which is strange because the the sheriff of Yorkshire actually, his base was the was the castle of York, which is in the city, in the within the city walls. So, um, but he couldn't arrest people in, in in the city itself. By the end of uh, the Elizabethan period, much shrievel work was conducted by under sheriffs. So, so under sheriffs, the deputies of sheriffs are really important as well. It varies by 
by sheriff and by county. So some some sheriffs delegated basically everything to the under sheriff, whereas other sheriffs preferred to keep a tighter grip on shrieval business themselves. So it's hard to generalize, but I think it's fair to say that the, the importance of under sheriffs uh, increased over this period. And do you could you change the next slide, please? So how many high sheriffs were there in England? So just to reiterate, high sheriffs were the sheriffs of uh, counties as opposed to the as opposed to municipal sheriffs. Well, before the before the start of our period, there were 20, 29, as you can see in the, the, the orange uh, table at the bottom. Uh, I, I hope it's orange. If it's not, I apologize. I'm, I'm colorblind, but I think it's I think I remember it being orange. Um, so between 1567 and 1575. Queen Elizabeth I Council organized the partition of eight joint sheriffwicks. So, so traditionally you had like Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, which were administered together under one sheriff. But, um, but many of these were partitioned in the, in the 1560s and 1570s. One of them, Surrey and Sussex, was partitioned, but then joined together again in 1571. So why, why, why were these partitioned? The most important reason was that there was a great... Uh, a great rise in, in litigation at Westminster and, and also in borough courts and local courts, actually, in, in the 16th century. Um, it's been, it's been uh, widely charted in the, you know, the book Pettifoggers and Vipers of the Commonwealth. And um, so we know, we, we've known for a long time that um, litigation rose in the 16th century. So this was the main reason why um, a, sheriff, a sheriff of two counties simply didn't have enough time to execute all of the legal writs which he, which he needed to do if there were, if there were more lawsuits uh, nationwide. And could I have the next slide, please? So how were sheriffs appointed? New sheriffs were appointed every year. So on the on the 3rd of, the, there was quite a procedure for this. So on, on the 3rd of November, leading officials met with the justices of the superior courts in Exchequer Chamber, a very a very large room, to nominate three candidates for each sheriff. Week. And this, this meeting produced a shortlist or a sheriff role, which was sent to the king. And he pricked the, his uh, final selection with a, a needle or bodkin. There was a there's a story that um, this tradition of pricking started with Elizabeth because one day someone brought her the sheriff roll to sign with or to dot with an ink, uh, uh, make an ink dot with a pen. But she didn't have a pen, so she used she'd been sewing, uh, doing some needlework, and she used the needle in her hand instead of uh, instead of a pen. But actually, it was. It's nice. It's a nice story, but it's not true because uh, pricking started in the reign of Henry VIII. So unless Henry VIII had a pension for needlework, then that's uh, then the story is uh, the story falls flat. The pricked roll then proceeded to chancery. So the the the, 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 the justices and councillors made a shortlist. The king chose the final selection. Then it, then the the pricked roll went to chancery, and the chancery would then issue the sheriff's patents, normally in mid to late November. So this is like the bureaucratic procedure on the surface, but of course. Underneath this formal procedure, there was lots of informal lobbying. So I put some stories in the book of um, people writing to councillors and saying, uh, I'll give you a nice hawk if you, uh, if, you, if you have this man or don't have this man as, uh, as sheriff. So uh, under the veneer of the procedure, there was all, all sorts of this uh, lobbying and court injury going on. Oh, I forgot this. Uh, would you, could I have the next slide? I was thinking I had control of it. So what was, the, what was the social status of uh, sheriffs? High sheriffs were drawn from the landed gentry, the same broad social group that provided justices of the peace. And many were legally trained. So in a PhD thesis of 1970, Terence E. Hartley estimated that around 60% of Elizabethan sheriffs had been to the ends of court. And sheriffs, the shrievalty was one of many hats worn at the same time. So sheriffs could serve simultaneously as cheaters, subsidy collectors, and so on. Until 1553, sheriffs could even serve as justices of the, justices of the peace at the same time. But um, the Parliament of Mary I uh, stopped that from, well, it made that illegal to hope to be a justice of the peace and a sheriff at the same time. And could I have the next slide, please? So what did the, what was this, what did the sheriff have to do? He was a generalist officer, uh, memorably described in 1943, 1944 by Helen Camp as the king's maid of all work in the regions. His duties included executing the king's writ, holding local courts, managing county and municipal prisons, arresting suspected felons, hanging convicted felons and traitors, collecting and accounting for royal revenue, seizing forfeited property, mustering soldiers, making proclamation and holding parliamentary elections. And funnily enough, uh, Tudor historians have mainly focused on the last of these, holding parliamentary elections. 
obviously driven by the importance and the, the importance of and interest in parliamentary history, but actually most parliamentary seats were, were, not, were not contested in, in the Tudor period. So actually parliamentary elections were quite rare um, or contested elections were quite rare. So, so, so I think it's important to see the Shrieval office in its entirety rather than just zooming in on this one, this one thing. Would you mind uh, changing the next slide, please? So I, I'm, I'm aware I'm running out of time. Um, so I, oh, there's not there's not enough time to talk about all of the all of those duties listed above. So I thought I would just talk briefly about some of some of them. So starting with one of the sheriff's courts. So the sheriff was responsible for holding the high sheriffs were, were responsible for holding two courts: the the county court and the sheriff's turn. And this turn, this court was called a turn. Um, because, um, well, it, well, first I should say it was held in each hundred of the, of the sheriff's bailiwick, which was not held by a private farmer. And the, the name supposedly referred to the fact that the sheriff had to turn or perambulate his county. So it's called a turn because he's turning around the county. The turn was, it could be considered to be a Commonwealth court. So it was designed to inquire into trespassers and felonies considered to be harmful to the Commonwealth. Many turns were held outdoors and in, uh, so what do I mean when I say Commonwealth matters? So in, in 1538, Sir Anthony Fitzherbert, the justice, uh, published a list of what things be inquirable in the sheriff's turn. And inquirable matters ranged from affray and arson to the alteration of boundaries, highways, and water courses. So, um, so anything from, from like crime to, to nuisance uh, came, came within the remit of the sheriff's turn. And could I have the next slide, please? Sorry, I'm, I'm racing through this a little bit because I want to get as much uh, get through as much as possible. So, so every male over twelve dwelling in each hundred was bound to attend, unless he owed suit to elite or was a tenant in ancient demesne. And th this suit owed to the turn was called suit royal. The court operated by a process called uh, double presentment. So, officers called tithing men or decanarii would make original presentments or allegations, while a jury would make final presentments. And if anyone's interested in that, then it was first explained, I believe, by the, by the great uh, legal historian uh, F.W. Maitland. There were at least 177 turns still operative in the Tudor period, uh, excluding municipal turns. And I say at least, um, there's, there's, there was almost certainly many, many more than that. Uh, so so that, that, um, that disproves the common idea that the sheriff's turn was kind of defunct in the, in the Tudor period. Could I have the next one, please? So this is a... This is a front cover of a, of a court book of the uh, sheriff's turn in, in Derbyshire. Um, so this is it's from slightly after our, our period, so 1606, but it was it was too good to leave out. So I had to I had to use it, even though it's three years too late. So this is in the I, it, as I as I as I might have already mentioned, it was in the Derbyshire Record Office in Matlock, which is incidentally one of the most beautiful, beautifully located record offices in the, in the whole country. And could I have the next slide, please? Um, so I won't talk too much about this. This is the list of freeholders who held uh, who owed suit to the court. If anyone's interested in chancery petitions, it's bound. It's in the binding. There's like a draft chancery petition which has been like stitched to make a cover for the book. And I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't say anything about that because um, it was kind of peripheral to my project. So if anyone wants to have a look at that, that might be uh, interesting for them. Um, okay, could I have the next slide, please? Thanks. So this, so. These, these things are really formulaic. So you can see at the in the margin, 100 day Morliston at Lit Church in Comitatu of Derby, um, Derbyshire. So this is the county of Derby. And at the top, it says Turn Turnus. So this is a Latin word for turn. And it, it, it says it's held by the like Sir John Harper, the sheriff of, of, the, fourth, of the said county. And that gives the dates and uh, says that it was held by Anthony Bradshaw as a, as a, a gentleman as a, who was acting as steward uh, of the court. So then it gives the people who Essoin. You can see it says Essoin in the in the left, and then fin, and then uh, it records that the constable the constable of Findon was sworn, and then the the uh, the, the free pledges or decanari I was sworn. And uh, at the bottom, I don't know if you can make it out. Just at the bottom there, it's somebody's being immersed ten shillings for not putting away his, uh, or several people are being put away for not are being immersed for not putting away their geese and ducks. So that gives you a <laughs> it gives you a sense of the. Um, the sort of offences which came came under the purview of this court. And could I have the next one, please? So this uh, some more typical offences here. So this is a guy called William Fo William Foster, sorry, who who broke the common pound, and he was immersed three shillings, four pence, and 
And then another guy also broke the common park. Then you've got uh, William Robinson, who, well, for, for illegal rescue. So he was a most 12 pence. So these are the kind of... Uh, these are the kind of things you see on on turn and 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 also lead records actually. And uh, could I have the next next one, please? So uh, I won't go on for much longer. So just briefly, the sheriff's second court, the county court. This was administered every four weeks. Um, the court welcomed civil pleas under the value of forty shillings. It was interesting. Uh, Samuel Samuel mentioned the the uh, the county court under in the reign of Edward III, but when it was of much greater political and legal importance. So in my period, the county court was was less politically important, and the, also the the litigation had become more trivial because the, the forty shillings cap had been set like centuries before. But of course, with the Great Tudor inflation, the value of forty shillings drastically declined. So so forty shillings was worth a lot more at the end of my period than it was at the start of it. Uh, so the, the typical county court would hear around thirty pleas every year. And Knights of the Shire were elected at the county court, as I mentioned. Um, and I already said that the, uh, the majority of parliamentary seats were uncontested. Um, could, you, could I have the next one, please? Maybe the, maybe the next one as well. Uh, I'm not, I, okay, I'll briefly go through this. Uh, so, interesting, Elizabeth was talking about the receipt rolls and the evidence for Ireland, which, was, which I thought was fascinating. I didn't know about that. Um, so... So in our period, the sheriff also accounted at the exchequer. Uh, he, he collected small traditional revenues for the king. Centuries before, there had been huge uh, revenues, but well, with the combined effects of inflation and the uh, diminution of royal lands, these they weren't very, very significant sums in the grand scheme of things anymore. So the two main sums were the corpus comitatus, the, the farm of the county, which was notionally consisted of rents payable by tenants of royal custody lands. And the second one was the Proficua Comitatus, profits of the county, notionally, again, consisting of profits from the sheriff's courts. And uh, I say notionally because anyone who's looked at these records realizes that uh, there's not, they're not always, there's not, you can't always find a rational scheme behind some of these things. But um, anyway, the, the sheriff also collected green wax debts, fines, immersements, and fines and immersements issued by other courts and forfeited recognizances. So, so according to figures compiled in 1602, payments by sheriffs accounted for only 3.5% of the total ordinary revenue received by the exchequer each year. So that really puts in stark, um, well, it really, uh, it starkly illustrates the, uh, the fact that these revenues are not very important. One of my, one of my theories is that, that they were retained to keep the sheriff in his place because the, the, making the sheriff account for these, these revenues was a tried and tested way of securing his deference as a royal agent. So that's that's one of my theories as to why it, these weren't abolished. Although in the book, I do talk about the, the reform of this system in, in, the, in the later reign of Henry VIII and in the reign of Edward VI in order to try and alleviate the sheriff's burden somewhat. Okay, can I have the next slide? Uh, so finally, um, a shameless plug for my book. <laughs> this, is the, this, is the, this is the book on which this presentation is based. Um, I think OUP did a really great job of the cover, so I'm so I'm, I'm really pleased with how that turned out. And that should be, it should be coming out in January 2022. But I, I think I annoyed the I think I annoyed the uh, the editorial team because I kept think I kept changing I kept wanting to change uh, certain phrases at the last minute. So it might it might be slightly delayed, but um, sooner or later it will be out. So if you're interested, then uh, please do uh, please do have a look, and uh, it would be nice to hear what you think of it. So thank you very much, everybody.